you, I first heard of you in politics and met you eight years ago. Had you done anything in politics before that? No, not really. I really hadn't. I, you know, uh, you weren't young Republicans or young Democrats. No, or other than other than going to the occasional dinner here and there. No, I really was never. I always, I, you know, I always kept abreast of politics, but I was never involved in it. No, and it's. I'll say this. What what got me interested or got me doing it in 2008 is what is getting me. Uh, uh, sorry, 2014. Uh, eight years ago. Yeah, eight yeah. years ago is the same thing now. I looked at, then it was about Obamacare and what I thought was happening to health care and looking at what was happening to our health care and how people that had no concept of, I've worked in VAs, I've worked in Canada, I've worked in major institutions, I've even worked for a short time in a private practice where we covered three universities when I was in Chicago. Uh, we did that. Um, so I understand how healthcare works and the good and the bad of it. And I looked at what was happening and I thought, these people don't understand healthcare and yet they're making all these decisions. And I look at it now, the same thing. I look at, I've never seen our country change so much and have so many problems all piling on top of each other uh, that I said, you know, I, 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 I can keep sitting on the sidelines and complaining or I can try to do something about it. Well, one of the great misnomers used by the progressives or liberals has been that they don't have health care and what we've got to provide them health care and what they really meant is insurance. That's correct. It's, it's health care. Everybody my, had health care. I, I, my, my, my line on that is uh, insurance is not health care. That's right. When 50% of doctors in Texas won't take new Medicaid patients, it doesn't matter if they give you Medicaid. If I told you that, that uh, uh, you're not going to do any better with that insurance because of all the restrictions, who cares? So it's more than giving you insurance. It's a matter of giving you health care. And we, politicians tend to, in every group, put everybody together. People that have no insurance are totally different from people who have uh, uh, maybe suboptimal insurance or, or people with Medicare et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the 85% of people, for instance, that had health insurance a few years ago before on Biomacare, they were fine. What they were interested in is cost. We should have addressed cost with them. The 15% of people that didn't have health care, that's a different story. We well, need to address wait, them we, separately. We address cost. We double the we cost. We double the it. cost. <laughs> right. Yeah, all or we did. more. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we, we, we drove the cost up and we didn't, and, and we didn't improve. You know, I, I always, I used to get, what well, people used to say, oh, we don't have the best health care. Our, our, our overall mortality rate is higher in this country than it is in others. It's interesting because, first of all, a mortality rate is not a good predictor of health care uh, because it takes into account smoking and diet and a whole bunch of things that have nothing to do with health care. But even if you do that, there was a great study done a number of years ago by some economists, and they they did two things. They took uh, murders or suicides, homicides, and they took car, uh, d death by car accidents out of the mortality statistics. And guess where you live the longest? The United States. Oh. It's just that they don't have that many Sweden, uh, many, many car accidents to kill people in Sweden. So you can't just use that. But even better was something else. I think it was out of the University of Iowa. Um, Two researchers looked at, what I really want to know is if I get sick, where do I have the best chance of living? If I have a heart attack, where's the best chance of living? If I get cancer, where's the best chance of living? So they looked at that uh, just before Obamacare, and I'll tell you something else about Medicaid in a second. They looked at that, and they looked at five cancers, five common cancers. I know breast was one, colon was one, uh, prostate, prostate was one. I, I, I'm blank. I think lung was one. I can't remember the five anymore. But they looked at them. In every single case, for every single cancer, you lived the longest. You had the best five-year survival in the United States. So our health care may be too expensive, and it may, we may need to help. And by the way, that's with the 15% of people not having health insurance. So, so it wasn't Canada or... No. 
Cuba or <laughs> no. The point is, is that we we I'm not saying healthcare doesn't need to be doesn't need to be uh, improved or doesn't need some fixes. It does, but you can't lump everybody together and then try to fix it that way. And why upend the best what I think is the best healthcare system in the world? If there's 85 percent of people that have good healthcare and have insurance, fine. We adjust costs with them. We address the 15% of people that don't. I love it when they say pre-existing conditions. Most people who have pre-existing conditions have health care because they work for a big company. It's the people that are, that are individuals that don't. And those people are, are more like one to two million people, and we can address that. There are ways of fixing the individual groups, which is what we should have done instead of redevising the entire health care industry and driving costs up and up and up. And, I, and I'm really afraid of where medicine is going these days. You go down to Los Angeles, you have more and more concierge doctors, people that, are, that won't even mm -hmm. see you if you have, unless they don't even take insurance. And, I, and so now you're starting to see, a, you know, years ago, if you wanted to get a great lawyer, you had to pay for him. But you, great doctors, we all took insurance. It's, I'm starting to see more and more people break out of that. So you're going to end up with the Do same system. Do you not system. like the uh, concierge system? I, I, well, I think you're starting. What's happening with, with what's happening in healthcare, and this is all being driven by the government. More, you know, it's the first time we've had less people in private practice. It's under 50 percent now. They're all going to work for corporations. So doctors are going to work for corporations. Well, their productivity goes down by 25 or 35%. Yeah, 80% percent. Percent of the doctors work for a hospital yeah. or a corporation. And, and, and that's all being driven by the government and they're both with their rules and regulations. As I said, we could sit here and talk about health care, and I'm not saying it can't be improved. It can. But, uh, you know, it's like I used to say to people, uh, would you send a politician to fix your business? But you'd send them to fix your health care? Really? I wouldn't. They didn't have, you know, you, you need, uh, there are ways of fixing it. There are ways of improving it, and it should be. But what we did for what this broad stroke, and that's, I think now the problems go way beyond health care. But health care is still a problem, and that I think we need to address. Yeah, I was introduced to the concierge uh, system. I didn't need it. I was old enough that I had all my yeah. uh, Blue Cross uh, and uh, but uh, Bruce Johnson the Beach Boy introduced mm -hmm. a, several of my friends and they were very pleased to be able to pay I think it was two thousand yeah. dollars and be able to pick up the phone. That's and exactly right but now think about it this way and I'm agreeing with that if you can that's what I said we're getting a tiered system more yeah. So I insurance is not meaning as much because we're getting a tiered system. You have to pay the $2,000 to get into that. And if you can't, then you go to the other person. Well, the concierge doctor is, doesn't have as many patients. No. So now when you have a doctor shortage, guess what? You have more of a doctor shortage. And now it's like the lawyer. To get the good lawyer, the really good lawyer, you, they don't take insurance. But now this is your health. So it's involving more and more people when this happens. I'm not putting it down in the sense that if, you know, I'm not telling you the doctors are doing it because they, they, they you know, it's free enterprise. But our healthcare system, the way we are changing it, I just am not happy with the where it's going. Well, uh, over the years I've noticed uh, doctors I know and businesses that are medical that well over 50% of the costs and time is in filling out government oh farms, insurance farms. You know, every doctor has four assistants, three of which are taking care of the. F yep. Is that accurate still? Oh, no. When my father went into business and opened up his own office, he had one nurse. She did everything. Did everything. Including the books. Because the books were you paid the doctor $25 or whatever when you went in there, and, and, and that was it. And you got major medical most of the time. So if you went to the hospital because you needed a big operation, you were covered. But insurance didn't cover the, the every doctor visit. And that because of that, the doctor didn't have to keep all these rec didn't have to do all this billing and didn't need all the back end. So things were, the costs were less. You know, when you put in all of this, all this, you know, all these, re all these regulatory uh, demands, it only drives up cost. 
uh, it doesn't drive them down. So, you know, concierge, you still need insurance because you still need insurance when you go to your other doctor. You're paying on top of your insurance. Yeah. For the specialists, and, correct. Uh, and you're uh, still going to need it when you go somewhere major else. Major medical. Yeah, you, know, you know there there's there was a before Obamacare there was a move underfoot to do concierge, but in a much different way by some people, where you would pay much less, maybe two hundred dollars a year, and therefore you would get uh, your, you know one 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 yearly physical and one set of labs, and then they had a chart of how much you would pay, very much like the old system. Um, I was say, but you can't do that anymore. Describing your father's practice sounded like a concierge today. Yeah, you can't do, but you can't do that. But these guys wouldn't, they, they wouldn't charge very much because of the fact that there was no billing. Yeah. And, but now it's a different, now concierge works differently because uh, costs and everything have gone up. The, uh, we talk about pre-existing conditions and major medical and these are terms that, unless you're in that group, which is a million or two people, the average person with medical insurance doesn't understand. No. And uh, uh, I, I would think that almost everybody has a pre-existing condition. It's caused, called life, but uh, <laughs> I think it's more specific. And uh, yeah, I mean, yes. It, 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 now we're getting into a long healthcare decision, and, and I'm, all I'm saying is that there are, if, if we want to talk about what changes I would make with healthcare, that's a different discussion, and we can do that. All I'm saying is that, as with any problem, or most problems, the answer is not a one size fits all. The answer is you, you, you analyze the problem, you, usually you'll find different groups and you have to solve the problems for each group. And they didn't, they lumped it all together. And then as what they do to small businesses, they put a whole bunch of regulations in to healthcare, which then drove the average doctor out of the uh, private practice business and into, and into a hospital. Yeah, we're gonna need to do a show strictly on this. We're gonna need to move ahead on what happened eight years ago and now. But as we were talking, it struck me that I want to ask you about the new capitalist areas of medicine mm -hmm. that uh, are kind of outside the insurance system. Mainly, you pay for surgery to the eyes, and uh, uh, the uh, doctors who will come to your house, mm -hmm. and you know it's completely. Well, that's going part, one step further than the concierge. But it's it's once again, it's just creating. It's it's what I said. You're crea you're getting to where you're getting tiered health again, and uh, you know I don't think. And you're getting and you're increased. To me, you're gonna. To me, the doctor shortage is gonna only get bigger. I was gonna say if a doctor's comfortable getting a thousand dollars a month from uh, two hundred patients. And not having much of an overhead, That's right? He's going to leave working for corporate. Uh, well, it's not only that. It, 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 when I have to, if I'm going to your house, one of the downsides to that is I can't see as many patients. So if I need to make the same amount of money, and then I have to charge more. And so, I'm not. I'm not against gap, doctors being capitalists any more than I'm against lawyers being capitalists. The, you know, the, but but the but the system. The system, I don't think, is help, helping the overall. What I'm looking at is it's not helping the overall health care of people. You know, Medicaid, there was a great study, uh, the Oregon Health Study. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you, maybe you know about it. They, somebody had a great idea in Oregon a number of years ago, before Obamacare. They said, let's, let's, we have all this extra money. We can insure, we can give 12,500 people approximately Medicaid. And we'll show everybody how much better they do. Well, they had a lot. Of, they 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 said that, and 25,000 people showed up. So they said some some brilliant person said, "Great, we'll give half of them Medicaid and half of them no, and we'll show everybody how much better they do." See, they just need insurance. Great. So th it was stopped. The study was stopped. I think after about three years. Uh, it's been a while since I read it, um, because Obamacare came in, and now everybody could get Medicaid. But the problem is, 
they couldn't show any improvement in any of the, any of the things that they measured for health. Uh, the only thing they could show was a 40% increase in emergency room visits right. because now they had insurance so they could go to the emergency room, which only drove up the cost of health care and clogged emergency rooms. So, you know, it's like if you give somebody health care but they can't get into a doctor, where are they going? Into emergency room. If anybody's been in the emergency room recently, good luck, for, good luck getting in without hours and hours of wait. And that's because we have a doctor shortage and that's because they, all, they think, well, I have... And then they can't get follow-up after they go to the emergency room, so they end up right back there. Suffice it to say you ran for Congress eight years ago right. in a crowded field that included Mitchum, uh, Fareed, and uh, who was the guy that I keep forgetting? Chris Mitchum. Oh, Chris uh, uh, Justin Fareed, uh, 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 Francisco. Uh, uh, Francisco, yeah. And uh, some others. And you came in in the middle of the field. Right. And uh, uh, you, once you saw the, uh, the field, the, you were less aggressive and raising money and fighting because you knew that these were pe local stars you were up against. So you left politics. Correct. And uh, several people talked to you about running for Congress, but you had the courtesy of saying, I want to wait and see what Andy Caldwell's going to do. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean this time? This time, yeah. Okay. And uh, when he, at literally the last minute, finally quelled all, uh, he never committed to run, but people were begging him and begging him to run, knowing this is a banner year for conservatives and Republicans, well, for everybody who's tired of what's going on. And you waited and literally filed the last day. <laughs> Correct. But when Andy said, I'm yeah. not running. Yeah, I, 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 some people talked to me and I said, if there's another good candidate, and it wasn't even limited to Andy, I said, if there's another good candidate, then I think that's who should, who should do this. The reason I even listened is, as I said, I'm looking at inflation is the highest in 40 years. And as I've said to people, if they calculated it the way they used to calculate it with the CPI, it would be, it would be the, maybe the highest in history. Crime, and yeah. crime is up. Homelessness. You know, to be fair to the people, to what you're saying is inflation right now is almost 9%. If we'd use the standards of 20 years ago, it would be over 16%. Correct. Correct. That's what I was saying. Yeah. No, Cor right. you were saying yeah. it right, but I wanted to put the number to it. Okay. So, yeah, we got homelessness that's a problem. We got crime that's a problem. We're defunding the police. Uh, you know, interest rates are going up. Uh, the debt is going through the roof. We're more concerned about uh, teaching kids gender, uh, gender identity and critical race theory in their first and second grade. We should be more concerned about teaching them math and science since kids, especially in California, are not doing so well compared to the rest of the country. They're, they're, there's a, there's a, they're looking, they're trying to go after charter schools. They're, they're talking about the Iran nuclear deal again, which has such huge implications. It, it's unbelievable. I just looked around and there's not one thing that I can see really, or almost nothing going well. And I just looked at it and I said, if, if there's no a good candidate, I got to do something. Boy, you are a, a masochist seeing all the problems you just outlined and you want to jump into the fray. Well, it, 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 I think at some point in time, you either, you, either, you either stop complaining about it and you try to do something about it or you, or you don't. I mean, I look at, I look at uh, the, you know, Salud Carbajal, he might as well represent San Francisco since, he, since he's voted 100% of the time with Nancy Pelosi. If the oh, wait a second. He brings home, uh, you know, parks and Grover Beach money and, and money for the hospice group and I, great I, causes. I, 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 love the way, I love the way politicians do this. They bring home money and they love to tell you how great it is. Oh, we brought home all this money as though it's free. And you look at it and you go, oh, isn't that great? He, he's, he's really doing a good job. He's bringing money back to us. Let, let, me, let me explain that to you. Let's say that you, just out of curiosity, let's say you have a great salary. You're making $350,000 a year in whatever you're doing. Really good salary. You're doing great. But your household is spending $450,000 a year. And you've been spending it so much on your credit card, you now owe $3 million in debt. 
Well, that's basically what the government is. The government has just done exactly that. They have taken, they, they're, they're taking in 3.5 trillion, just to add some zeros, but they're spending 4.5 trillion. And now, and their debt is 40, over, th now their debt's 40. over 30 trillion dollars. Yeah. So they're bringing home all this quote unquote free stuff like it's free, it's not, it's on a credit card. So who do you think is going to end up paying the credit card? Eventually you are, and eventually your kids are. I mean, you, if you were doing that in your house and you built up all this debt, you'd, you'd probably say, hey, we need to stop spending so much. But it seems to be free. And the other thing that people forget about is, how, so how is the government doing this? How do they do this? Since they don't have a, really a credit card, but they do. They, have, they can just print money. They just keep printing money as though it's, as though it's free as we can just do it. My analogy to that is if I took three, $5 trillion, the last bill where they printed $5 trillion up, if I took $5 trillion in diamonds and I put them out on the open market, what would happen to the price of diamonds? Whoop! They'd I'm go, a buyer. <laughs> they'd go way down. Your diamond would not be worth very much. Well, guess what happens when they put $5 trillion of new money into circulation? Your dollar's not worth as much. Well, that's why we haven't, that's partly why we have such bad inflation. Dollars are not worth what they used to because now we got so many of them, they're ubiquitous. And they, so it's not free. You're gonna pay for it, the debt goes up. You're gonna pay for it inflation. You're gonna pay for it in hidden taxes. But Salud's not gonna tell you that. He's just gonna tell you, oh good, I just, I'm giving you more free stuff. But you're gonna pay for it and you are paying for it in your taxes and in your inflation even if you don't think so. I, I thought of the term, one of the 10 things years ago when we began to reform Congress, uh, when Newt Gingrich became mm -hmm. speaker, and there one it was the no more earmarks. Right. And that's what, every time the Democrats come in and some Republicans, they began to do earmarks. Mm -hmm. And it, we, everybody if that remembers earmarks, remembers the bridge to nowhere right. in Alaska. <clears throat> So these are really what Salud's doing. He's doing these corrupt earmarks and claiming victory. And you're just pointing out it, it, the money's going to be spent on and it's going to cause our wages to be worthless, our taxes to be more, and inflation to be more. The money has to come from somewhere. And, you, and I love that how they always keep saying, oh, the rich are going to pay for it. They're going to pay their fair share. And I, as I've said to people before, I love the word fair, because politicians love to point that out. I mean, who's not for fair share? Who's not for fair land use? Who's not for fair housing? But you know, as a doctor, I, you can't say that. I can't say, well, if you have surgery tomorrow, you'll have a fair chance of doing well. Um, you want to know, what does that mean? But politicians don't like, to, don't like to describe that. They like to just say fair because then it sounds so much better. We'll, we'll, get, the, we'll get the rich to pay their fair share and it'll pay. And that never happens. The taxes always get down one way or another to the middle class and to most people because that's where the money is. You've added a new lexicon to the uh, uh, conservative, clear thinking person. We used to tease that you get in an argument or a debate with the left and it's feeling. No, nothing behind it, but we feel we should do this. Mm -hmm. Now you're adding feel and it's going to be fair. <laughs> oh, everything. Oh, it's the, it's, they, the politicians love to use the word fair because who's not for fair? I mean, who, who would be against, you know, fair use of, of land, a fair, what, fair housing, fair, some, pay your fair share. But they, you can't, you got to define these things, but they don't want to because then they can get themselves in trouble. You love to quote uh, Martin Luther King, who was for equality, and then think about what the new liberal term equity is. The problem. And of course, yeah. salutes for equity. And the problem, I have, I have, look, I, I, I'm a believer, and I, I'm, I believer, I'm a believer in what Martin Luther King said. I want to be judged by the content of my character, not the color of my skin. And I think that's how people should be looked at. People don't realize that equity is bad for, so, for, the, for the person often they're trying to help. For instance, okay, so if, if I'm for equity and I'm just going to put that people there. everybody's Everybody, I have to have 13% of heart surgeons need to be 
people of, of black, black and however many people need to be Hispanic. Well, that means a lot of people that are going to be heart surgeons may not be the best heart surgeon, which does two things. First of all, it makes me, when somebody walks in, it makes me wonder, do I really want that doctor to operate on me? Maybe they got into medical school because they were, they, we needed equity and they're not that good. And it also hurts the people who, the person like Ben Carson, who's a great neurosurgeon, he just happens to be black. It, it diminishes them because they have to go through thinking, people having to think of them, did they re, were they really that good? Did they get in because of other reasons? And you have, you by pushing, th look, I think education is the civil rights issue of our time. I really do. And I think we need to do our best to educate as many children in, as well as we can. But that's got to start young. If when, we, when we take a child who is uh, uh, finishing high school and put them in a school that, they, that they're not going to do well in, first of all, the dropout rate is high. We haven't helped them. They're going to often study things that they're not interested in because they're not going to be do well enough to do it. And as I said, if they graduate and they are not that good, do we do you really want them to be your accountant? Do you really want them to be your lawyer? Do you really want them to be your doctor? It's it's not fair to the to 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 anybody to do that. I think if you if we want to address this, we address it with the with the with the schooling of the young. I've often used the thing of equity. Uh, I, I, and I think I may have said this to you in the past, um, of a, of if you look at equity and you say 13% of the population is, is black and 76% is white, well, that means our basketball team should be 76% white and 13% black. <laughs> and if, as soon as I say that, you'd say, well, no, that would be horrible. Our team wouldn't win. Well, what do you think is going to happen when you introduce equity into medicine or into your business or into other things? You think suddenly that's, that's fair? It's, you, you're making, to me, equity is racist. It's the most racist thing I've ever heard. You are judging people on their skin color. And as I said, I believe in Martin Luther King. You shouldn't judge people on their skin color. We should make it so that people have equal opportunity and you should give them all equal opportunity. People need to have that, and we need to help education because that's the most important thing we can do for our kids. But forcing the issue by, by race, I think, is, is one of the worst things that we can do. So in education, you would be for making kids read, write, and do arithmetic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like, to get, I'd, like to worry, I'd like to worry less about gender when they're, one year, when they're in their first grade, and I'd like to worry more about reading and writing. I'd like to give parents more of a choice on where they go to school. You want to talk about differences between rich and poor, the, you know, it's the school systems and where we force them or not force them to go to school. You know, it seems like charter schools over and over again, they're not always better, but a lot of times they are if we give parents choice. Money should try to follow the kid, not the, not, not the district. So the parents have a choice where they want, have more of a choice where they send their kids. Parents are not, parents want to help their kid. They want their kid to get better. Well, we had, uh, and we're getting down to our last couple of minutes, we had one of the greatest examples of the failure of education and the tearing of it in that private schools stayed open. Private schools functioned. The public schools, most of places in California were closed for two years. And so the oh. poor whites, poor uh, people of color, they were put back two years behind other people. Oh yeah, and, 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 and see, that gets back to you, were talk, we were talking about research earlier. I know how to read a research paper. I know how, it, how to analyze it because that's what I did for my, most of my adult life. When I look back at how we managed the kids in school with COVID, it's appalling. We, we did so much harm, and it was so obvious so far, behind, so far before we started to open the schools up. We've damaged these kids, if not for years, maybe for life. We've done so much damage by closing it down long after we knew that that was the wrong thing to do. So we, yeah. What we do to the, what we've done to these public school kids by just the, the just the COVID, and that doesn't even get into the fact that, as I said, if you compare Texas and California, the Texas kids do much better, and yet 
they collect le no taxes, and here we got the highest taxes in the in the country, and the kids are not getting as good on the, in the standardized tests. So we've we're failing we're failing the kids here, and I think that we need to try to change uh, how we how how these kids get educated instead of teaching them things that don't have anything to do with their. Got one minute. Sure. What's happening with small businesses as you travel this district? What are you seeing? Well, it's, it's, it's a shame when you go down any street, any big street, now you see uh, for lease signs, a lot of businesses have closed. Regulations and taxes are killing, are killing small businesses. As a small business my, owner myself, I understand that. The Biden administration with the Democrats have the largest amount of, uh, they, they put into, uh, in the first year, about $201,000 billion in new regulations and 130 hours which beats the last two administrations hands down. So they Brad, keep putting them in. You're great. You'll be back. Thank you. And we may even have to specialize on shows, talk about medicine and talk about politics. And uh, you're a beautiful wife who is, was more than a Charlie's angel. Oh, thanks. Thank you.